let's let's um let's let's end it off officially while if we... you don't want podcast if you don't want spoilers for westworld season two stop listening now <sighs> all right you get mad i'm gonna drain my dick dude okay just get just prep your brain i because d- uh, there's just there's a lot and I guess it's going to determine, it's going to depend on where you want to start with this. Because the problem really can go back to season one if you need to. But I feel like I addressed the season one problems already, right? I feel like when I was talking about season one, I basically explained what I thought was wrong with it and how essentially we had an extremely promising start, right? The introduction of can <laughs> can can a human be human? Uh, anyway, the, the introduction of um, artificial life, questioning sentience, questioning sapience, the feelings it feels. If they're programmed to feel a certain way, does this actually matter uh, versus our? sense of like well are we programmed and so on and so forth does being made of flesh and blood inherently carry more significance than being mechanically programmed and the original answer was i don't know yes that's kind of the point right um then you get to then you kind of go like all right well while we just try to discover this question or or if, if this question even has an answer Let's start looking at other aspects. And you would say like, all right, what can we compare then? If we can't just say automatically that being a robot means your feelings are valid. Right. Then can we what say... What about special robots? Are you... Or are, are we'll say like, do the complexities of your emotions go through the same level, right? Like, you try, you try to size it up in different ways, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, season one goes along fine, except Maeve... Is the character that comes along and has her magic powers, and then sometimes You're free now uses them. Sometimes Marcus is it, but then otherwise sometimes doesn't. And then that's where you start to see some of the problems. Where like the way Maeve gets freed is based on her taking human hostages who have to, th- under fear of their lives, do what she says, then punch off the clock, go home. Have dinner, take a nap, wake up, go back to work, find Maeve, and become hostages again. Oh no, she's going to get us! <laughs> right? And everything about that entire storyline, you're like, oh no, this falls apart the moment that um, we have to consider human incompetence, right? That goes through, and then you get to the end of the series, where, or the end of the season... Where other things go down and things are here and there, but for the most part, it's it's strong. And Anthony Hopkins is fucking strong. He's and big strong man. And and Bernard is 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 um doing what he does, and he finds out his problem. But you know, he finds out oh, I'm a robot too. But he still has his his drive and his cornerstone and the things that make him want to do his job. So ultimately, he's kind of learning to deal with the fact that he too has been programmed, but he still feels what yeah. he feels. Uh, and then the the gunfighting starts, and then the shoot bangs occur. Yes. And then at some point, a bunch of robots start, a bunch of hosts break out, and then the fighting happens. And the dumbest part of the season finale is the fact that soldiers with automatic rifles are looking at a robot who is killing people and going, "Put it down! Put the gun down! Plot character, put it down!" Plot armor, put it down, right? And then just getting killed. When it should just be, hey, look, it's there. Bang, 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 bang. Okay, so now take that moment. Oh, no. That moment. The single worst moment of the entire first season. Copy it, paste it, and stretch it out over 10 episodes. It is literally. not good. The the whole, every, there is, okay, over the course of 10 episodes in in Westworld season two, There is one fight with future soldiers that they win. Every single battle that has that has dudes in body armor and fucking vehicles like 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 um um uh, ATV like fucking things with future guns with future guns rolling up on a bunch of people 
on horses with revolvers and they're getting destroyed by them and it's not that we've seen their like oh their accuracy is better no they haven't been modified in any way we haven't seen any of that they're just normal ass stupid fucking old school people with shitty old guns and they're fucking dying left and right to these to these old people on horseback right then you fucking get a moment where that that one where they win and they win through sheer numbers because it's a whole fort versus a bunch of, again, dudes coming from the bushes, riding their vehicles and driving up. And then a bunch of people with guns that can clearly shoot. Like, I can stand a mile away with a sniper rifle and pick you off, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. I have, an, I have a gun that can shoot that like much more accurately because it's from the future. Your old style gun is pretty much made to be, I have to be within a few feet of you. Yes, they have the people with the machine guns walking forward into the range of the people with the shit guns and then dropping dead. And it makes no fucking sense the whole time. So, cause, so soldiers just, you, you eventually at a certain point, the soldiers in the story are no, they don't mean anything. Yeah. Right? It's a minor inconvenience to where their main characters have to go, what the plot, like there's just things. Oh no, there's soldiers there. Don't worry about it. You know that bit in Star Wars uh, Episode One where they're about to break out all the ships and they look in and there's like a hundred fucking robots in there. Oh, the robots, yeah. And they go, oh, there's a lot in there. And and Qui Gon goes, oh, it won't be a problem. You know that bit? Sure. And it's like, oh wow, so excited now for this enemy force that'll be trivial. That's right. what you're describing. What is the purpose of having these people with their guns and their armor and their vehicles? Literally, at the end of the season, a dude shot six times with basically the barely able, able to stand up, riding a horse, takes out soldiers on a fucking... It just it makes no sense, right? Anyway, um, every storyline... Before, Maeve was stupid, but now every storyline gets infected with... With that same short-sightedness. So you see that problem with the guns and the whole dumb thing. Yeah. And then you start seeing, oh no, the writing is not all Nolan now. There's other people getting involved. And I don't know if, if it if it if it's I don't know I don't know who to attribute it to. But it's not being thought out. Problems are not being dissected and actually presented like what would you do if you had this ability in this moment? So like you have things where at any point Maeve going through her problems, she can literally wave her hands and make the problems go away. Especially when, like, um, like, like other people are like whatever the whatever's attacking her. Like, there's so many moments where she can wave her hands and just take control of somebody or make something happen, and she doesn't for whatever particular arbitrary reason it's they choose. There's a drama in the scene, and then so, at some point they realize we have to create the the thing that we have to nerf her. We have to handicap it, right? Well, it's, 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 it's Maeve in Westworld is the problem that we've discussed about how you can't have Akuma or Charlie or Gen or Oro walking around in your story. They're too strong. Their power invalidates drama. So there's a, there's a moment where they take a completely useless detour to Samurai World that results in nothing. It's cool because Samurais, though... Yeah, and it's fun to watch that happen and to see the same scene. They do a uh, like an uh, uh, it rhymes. It see like, there's an echo to it. Yeah. The there's you get to see the same saloon parlor thing happen except it's in Samurai World, and it's like oh look that's a cool version of that. Um, and uh, but the whole trip that they go there and they leave it is just fan service or whatever. While they're there, there's a point where it's like how do we stop Maeve? Okay, the people coming up to her are literally trying to grab her mouth. To stop her from barking her commands. Because if she speaks, yeah. then she's going to be able to take control of them. Sure. Right? Uh, they get to an army where they're like, oh, she, the witch is coming or whatever. She, she can just speak her words and everyone follows what she says. And the, and the army general is like, maha, I've cut off the ears of all my men. So they can't hear you. That's the and then they do a big dramatic plan to everyone's ears that are cut off. And like, haha, what are you going to do now? And she displayed her ability to take over people's minds anyway without saying anything. So she's already getting her, yeah. her level up in the middle of the process. So, haha, your spells are not going to work. I've cut their ears off. Take them away. And then he continues Wait, to... what? And then he continues to bark commands to his soldiers who have their ears cut off. But for some reason, they can still hear him. 
And it like and it just completely it, That's the dumbest thing ever. The contrivance they just created, it completely ignores that in the exact moment where that happens. Um Oh my god. Well, wow, that's really fucking stupid. In the meantime, we cut over to Dolores, who's uh and so I'm gonna assume the new main character. Well she's she's always was. Yeah. Okay. Um but she now she's kill 'em all Dolores. And she's riding around on her horseback and shooting everybody up and being all some are not made for the valley beyond and just whatever. You never get a description as to what or why she's choosing certain people or not. And you never get a description as to what or why certain robots are capable of being free, quote unquote, and others are not. Mm -hmm. You don't ever really know. There's implications that looking at the symbol is all it takes but then there's also the earworm of violence delights meet violent ends. But there's a difference between the two. And in some cases, it, I, my theory is that seeing both or somewhat makes an effect. But it never gets explained, right? Whatever. But the whole point of the first season is that you, in order to become free, you needed to go through like exhaustive amounts of suffering in order to create a, like a, enough experience. And furthermore, there's the moment of having the conversation with your inner monologue that creates that yeah. voice that you go, this is me. Right. It's a really awesome moment that happens for Dolores. Yeah. You cut to... The guy that was behind Dolores when she had that moment that built up, who just walks up to the sign, looks at the cutout of it in wood, and goes, I hear the voice, basically. And you go, oh, literally, you can just cut past the entire season that, of build-up to just give him that so exact that whole, moment whole, with no struggle whatsoever. that makes the whole first season not matter. It that was the whole point of the whole first season. So people can just arbitrarily get it sometimes, but we again, we don't know for sure because we don't know exactly what seeing the sign does. Maybe, my theory to make it work is that you have to assume it's a memory that they don't actually have, that when they look at it, it makes them break off their programming because they're trying to remember something that isn't there, isn't a part of their actual narrative. Like I'm like, I'm like uh, you can excuse it away if you want to do that, fine. Regardless, she's going down her path, and she's uh, she literally demonstrates that by kidnapping one of the humans that work for uh, the fucking company and giving him an iPad, that you can walk around and you can juice people up, you can turn them into gods, you can do what Maeve did, right? Yeah. You can straight up... Edit anything about yourself. Well, yeah, that, that was a thing they established in the first thing, that every aspect of their personality can be fucked around with with an iPad. To the point that death doesn't matter, because she demonstrates uh, by going to a confederale, dude, she needs, she needs an army. So she goes to the army leader and goes, give me your army. And he's like, nah. And he's just like, okay. She kills him, and then brings in their human slave, plugs in the iPad, resurrects him, and goes, see? And then he goes, oh, fuck. And then, like, ah, she's a god. She can do what she wants, right? Great. She reprograms Teddy to become a super accurate killer assassin dude sure. with the iPad. And basically has the ability to nullify all of her problems by keeping this iPad around, plugging it into anyone that and dies. The and the person who mans it. And bringing them back and then solving the issue. Like literally... It's not a problem anymore, right? Mm -hmm. They make reference to the fact that she wants to get rid of their data copies because then because they're they're chained by having the the pro the feeling of immortality in that way and whatnot. But it doesn't make sense that she would want to have her goals be to like survive this conflict, and she wouldn't exploit having fucking god mode yeah. in her possession. And she uses it sparingly here and there, and then ultimately takes that human with the iPad and then puts him on a train and blows him up. When it's her biggest single advantage why, why? over the whole sco or the, the season, why does, why does she do that? there's no purpose. And then anytime someone loses or something doesn't go her way, it's like, oh shit, oh so bad, well, it sucks, whatever. But it's like you literally could have just iPaded your problems away. So you're describing a story in which everyone is overpowered, but they're too dumb to realize that they're overpowered. Incompetence is the only way things move forward, right? We get to a point where um, like Maeve shot. is caught and shot or whatever, lying on a gurney, and she's like, like, oh, I'm bleeding out and dying, whatever, and then they capture her and they try to study her brain to make her shit like, work for others and to figure it out. And it's like, on the process of her lying on the gurney, like, the people that have, have her tied up there, unlike every other robot that gets dragged in, gets pretty much a bullet in the head or, you know what I mean? They just get ripped open and they pull their brains out, whatever. She's special because she's got these powers. We can assume they don't want to mess with it or whatever. So she's lying open on this thing. And, like, P 
people that are dealing with her, while they're super just treating everything else like it's a toaster, yeah. they're basically like, oh, don't you worry. One day, girl, you're going to get it. Ooh, the human just, they can't wait to just kill this main character. And it keeps cutting back to her being there sweating and going, oh, no. And then this human just being like, I can't wait to kill you. Oh, it's the, so the, good. The person who doesn't look at her as anything more than a laptop. Until... Four or five, I think four episodes go by of her lying on a table. Whoa, fucking what? That's stupid. Until eventually the moment comes where she go, she has like a, a thing where whatever, like a, like Ford passes by and gives her a message and stuff. That's but what she's, I figured. But the point is she's slung on the table. Then she finally decides I'm going to take control of the dead bodies in this room, bring them back up and kill that guy. That was like. Oh, all right. I could, I could do that. Any, uh, you could have done it at any moment, but we needed to wait till this exact point because the plot required it to happen here and not before this moment. Yeah, that's smart. Um, one of the most important scenes is them going down to the cradle, which is where all the AI backups are. And, cool. Um, they are basically going down there to uh. uh what it, like like they basically there's a moment where, where they're they're going down there and she's uh, one of the robots is going to destroy it and a soldier's coming down there to stop them and whatever the fuck. Why and, would the soldiers give a shit about their data backup? Well, it, it's a whole weird it's a whole fucking weird thing. But the point is that they have infinite backups that they can make of themselves and so on in this in the in the cradle. And they have a girl down there that's her job is to go and, and and fucking take the place out. And then oh no, before she can accomplish her mission, a soldier comes in. And 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 uh, goes, hey, freeze, don't move, right? But this is not just any, like, random host. This is a sexy host. It's the first blonde one that was, like, super attractive to William in the first season. And, and he's all like, hey, you don't move. And she's all like, who, me? And then he's like, yeah. And then he walks up to her with the gun. And unlike the 30 random dudes that he blew shot through the 30 road off to get to, to this get room. to this room he he's, this one's at gunpoint because she's special and then while he's up close pointing the gun at her he's like and she's all she's, all, she's like you know you know i'm like like he goes like oh you're pretty aren't you that you're perfect he's like yeah they designed me to be and then bat my eyelashes and flirt 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 and but da 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 grab your grenade and blow you up and it's like so in this moment, you can see the writer's room being like, oh, you know what would be so poetic if the turning point here is that we see humanity in its basest form in the soldier that's about to finish the mission. Like he's overcome with lust and it shows you how base humans are and that the robots are so much more advanced because they tricked them. And this fucking soldier who's trained to deal with this situation just gets a boner and walks down to the threat with his boner and they fail the mission because a random soldier has a fucking heart on humans are so weak <sighs> there's a point that's really dumb that's there's a really, point it's really dumb i desperately want to watch it now there's a point in towards the end where they're talking about the th so I was describing this a little bit earlier about how it's like, okay, you have humans and you have robots and you go with the conflict between them, but the humans are trying to fight for their survival, but there's evil humans being shitty and to, or evil right. to the robots. Uh, but the robots are slaves and they're trying to emancipate themselves. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. Tell us a good story. Yeah. Um, that's a conflict that is worth seeing through to the end. But in the middle of it, we introduce evil rich assholes that are trying to uh, make themselves immortal by copying themselves into robot brains. Okay, we've established on this podcast many times that's not how that works. But <laughs> the threat of itch, rich, infinite asshole people yeah. being immortal is so much more obviously evil and devious that throwing that in the rent is a wrench in the fucking works that just goes, well, obviously we hate that more than the other two. So it's just a cop-out where you don't have to answer the actual questions about robots gaining sentience or gaining sapience or being worthwhile yeah. because you have an easy thing to hate over here. And then they spend a bunch of time focusing on that. And then we get to a point where it's like, also, do you know what the park is for? Do you know what this is? Whatever. They build up this whole thing of hinting at secret origins where it goes from being like, a tease and a tease and a tease to being like just fucking get it over with just tell me I don't care anymore almost yeah. and it's like oh we were secretly copying the data of all the guests in the park so 
we were putting them that we were copying them into like into a giant hard drive sure of guest data why it doesn't quite describe why but it says that it's valuable to have a bunch of guest data okay but what are you going like to do Facebook. with it right what's the point of delos keeping all this data it's like it's valuable whatever they like but why though and then there's other alternative reasons bernard has so that he puts it aside so that uh, uh um dolores can learn about humans and therefore overthrow them right that's the alternative reason that this other person gives but the main corporate reason for it is never explicitly stated and they just fucking hand wave it and go whatever okay fine it's for advertising how did you get all this data that would take a brain scan and these people were living in the park and it would take forever to do it and then there's this kind of like well this kind of like wink wink moment of literally dude pointing to his hat and then someone goes of course shut up the brain scanner was in the cowboy hats all along pat shut up and as long as you're wearing your cowboy hat your brain scan was happening and it was transmitting your data shut up remotely to the forge of course and that's why when William was a kid and he walked up as the first guy on the guest list and he went up the thing and the first thing they do is they put the cowboy hat on you so that the brain scan starts immediately. Brain scans in the cowboy hats and we just move on. We hand wave past it. We move on. Um, Dolores is fucking stupid with that shit of that, giving that, up the... That, that is one of the dumbest things I've heard you say <laughs> about a story. That's real bad. Okay, so so Maeve, pointless. Dolores, stupid. Dumb. Uh, Bernard, what are you up to? Well, um, it's very clear that you're hiding something from the viewer. Something big. You've got a big twist Just or like whatever. Last time. So what we're going to do is we're going to make you bumble your way through the entire season where every episode literally consists of him shaking his glasses in his hands, being very nervous about what's happening. Someone comes and pulls him one way or another, whether it's Tessa Thompson or Elsie or whoever the fuck, and he's just getting dragged around. For the entire season, Bernard has zero agency as a character. He never makes a single decision or states an opinion outside of these moments of like flashing back to him being out of control or things we don't know. That is baffling considering what he was doing in season one. But you know that they're setting it up to be like the reveal is that this is the truth. But because they can't tell you the reveal until the final episode, you just have to sit there and watch him do nothing, or not have a memory, not know what to do. And you just he just bafflingly, again, he just he's on a ride that everyone's dragging him along. And he has so much importance in the first season that it's just frustrating. Because he does nothing. He he's, does he's absolutely the, he's the nothing. the most important person in the first season. And the actions he's taking don't actually state an opinion on what he feels about what's happening. He doesn't say anything of consequence. He's just a zero agency on a fucking path that's going to lead to a reveal. All right. But until that reveal, he had, there's no point to the nine episodes of him. So, so the reveal is, is that he made a decision to... Um, he had to to, de to destroy his memory because Ford comes back inside of his brain and uh, like what? because Ford con converted himself into a data. Oh, sure, he and did. exists in a data version of, of of the West World. Great, and then eventually puts himself inside of of Bernard, and Bernard's going through the whole thing, and then eventually realizes that the only way to make these timelines, the only way to make to make it out or whatever, is to do some crazy ass shit and um, sneak the people out of the park and. Uh, create what is essentially heaven for robots and then also bring back Dolores and make a clone of her by by putting her in Tessa Thompson's brain. Okay. Uh, by killing Tessa Thompson and then making a fake Tessa Thompson. Uh, so all of that basically is like, I, I know there's going to be a reason for this at the end of Bernard's storyline, but the whole time you're wasting our time because there's nothing to lead up to it that's interesting. Uh, the man in black, you go through his entire arc of him being like, I'm just a shitty old guy and I've got my family problems and, uh, but I really have a dark side to me and, and I'm a murderer and whatever. I and, love murder. And then they build up this whole thing with him. And it's actually interesting when he sees his daughter and she's coming for him and so on. And 
you know, and then like they go, they're building up this whole thing where it's like, okay, but there's a secret about him in his profile that is going to be the reason why everyone in his family hates him, like why his wife hates him and why his daughter hates him and whatever. But we don't know what that is yet. And they build it up to be such a huge secret that's going to be a bomb drop as if it's something we don't know. And they direct the scenes around us not knowing. Mm. There's a mystical key card that has all the secrets he's holding back. Sure. And, his, and his wife hates him and she lashes out at him because it's like she knows something about him, you know, but like... That she doesn't say. And, and, and she's like, yeah, you're just a liar or whatever, but the, but, the, but the story's not telling us what it is. And then it turns out that the big secret is on the recording, it's like, oh yeah, you were an asshole. Back in the past, you just you treated people like shit. It's like, oh yeah, the thing we knew already. Wait, what? So to find that. So in the first season, he's blowing, he's shooting innocent people and doing all this horrible stuff. Yeah, and we know that. And then later on, they build up a whole story around his family not knowing about him, but also like, what hating him for a reason? No, but like the reason is they're mad that he acts like a dick in Westworld. Yes. And, Are you fucking serious? And they make it seem as if it's a thing that's going to be a huge bomb drop when it's just a thing it's what we, we already need. It's what you watch. It's for the only episodes. thing that's there about him, and then it just built. And it's so the only thing you know about his entire character. So then it just it's, it's all for nothing. All this buildup is nothing. Great. Okay. Perfect. Um. Now, the reason why I don't understand the re- now. And by the way, um, um, one of the one of the. Like there's a re- there's a great character in the show that is the guy that wrote Maeve's um, uh, uh, story, mm-hmm. right? The the guy with the British accent that's like a, a cocky jerk and he fucking like he's like going through the whole park and going like I don't know anything about this shit. You're stupid robots. I just write the stories. Yeah. And he gets pulled along for the ride, and then eventually he starts caring for Maeve, and then goes through this whole thing. And it's like he and then he starts believing in the plight of the robots because him along with the Asian guy and the redhead that got like strung along the whole time. <laughs> sure. We're just forced into this thing. And they have, like, zero lines, by the way. But whatever. They're going along with the rest of the fucking... The goof troop. And, like... It gets to a point where they're finally going towards the big valley... Sacri- the big valley moment. And then this guy, in his thing of caring, decides to sacrifice himself in this big blaze of glory that... Like... They set it up, but it just it's just out of character with... It. Like, it... it, it I, we, I get that he changes, but it seems like such a non-practical move to make where this guy stands up and goes, I'm going to fight the humans for you as a human. You robots go on to make it. I'll be the sacrifice. And then so he stands up to go fight the guy to hold back the guards or whatever. And then the guards that are there are like, sir, please stop. We don't want to shoot you. Sir, what's not you or after? Sir, and he's like, I'm doing, he's doing his big final speech. And he's doing like, I, and he's, he's going up and rah, da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. And the guards are like, sir, just stop. You don't, like, you don't actually, ha- none of this, actually, you, we can just take you in. Just put the gun down. And he's going off on it, and then the guy, they get away. He makes enough time for them to get away. And then, like, they just fucking shoot him. And he goes, ah, and his blaze of glory moment. But it's like... The most pathetic blaze of glory For ever. no actual reason, because he stalled for time. And he, that kind of character would probably have just been like, okay, whatever, I'm going... Wouldn't you just stall for time it, by distracting them and then let them take you in? And then... Would that not have been but an no, it, it, it just It's a weird moment. Now, the reason... Now, all of that combined is just fucking horseshit. <laughs> but... And there's more that I, I like, I, I, you know... Skimmed or skipped over. Yeah, like, like uh, you know, there's one point where... Uh, well, here's the thing. The reason why this hurts and the reason why this fucking sucks is because just like the first season, there's some brilliant moments that are legitimately cool mm-hmm. that fucking raise your expectations or get your hopes in a place where, like, if you just steer this way, you can maybe fix this. Yeah. At no point... Every time it steers off course, you're like, oh, but you can turn it back a little bit. And then it just, no. no. Um, one of those moments is uh, in a scene where um, you, you, you have uh, James Delos, the, 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 the old asshole founder guy that basically uh, is like, it's, you ba- it's basically anytime they do Black Mirror things. Yeah. So this guy, so he's like, his whole thing was like, oh, he, he, he'd love to live forever, or lever, live forever or whatever. And at some point, we just cut and leave that alone. And then at some point, we wake up and we see him in a nice clean room. And he's going through this whole thing where he's, he's, he's living rich in his fancy apartment. Yeah. And then young William comes in and talks to him. And then they go through this whole process where like in his interview and in him talking to him, 
like eventually he starts having these moments of like having a bit of a like memory loss and mental breakdown and stuff and things are just not adding up mm. and then in the process of the conversation the the old man realizes that he is a copy of the original old man yeah. and that this is just a test for fidelity and the problem is that the copies keep breaking down after a few moments of awakening into oh. a human body right so it's an interesting moment that is like okay this is a thing and they run through tons of tests yeah. and then they're like oh d- this one fails and then they incinerate it and then start it's, from scratch right a uh, lot things like that that are legitimately interesting again samurai world is cool for what it is if you ignore the fact that it's just fan service and has no bearing on the plot but then later on they do a better version of that where they spend an entire episode with um the the you know the ghost nation people like the natives yeah. that are like like in the in the all white um thing uh body paint there's an episode about them, and it's all in na- a native Ghost Nation language, and it's um Ghost Nation. What I, I, it's a type of native language. I don't know the name of it, but they spend the entire episode in that language, and it's awesome, and it describes what the fuck they were doing the whole time, yeah, the significance of them, and why their story matters in the grand scheme of things, and it's really good, and it has really important bearing on the plot. So it wasn't just Samurai World fucking go off and have Samurai Dick Adventures and come back. There's actually a really good thing where you can go and change the camera perspective to another culture, follow this whole thing around, and then have it have significance. Unlike like when we jumped over to Raj World for a minute where it's like, hey, there's a whole other park where they're hunting tigers and doing like... Um, like Maharaja stuff mm-hmm. and we just ignore it and we leave it alone we just drop the hint that it's there and then we- I have a serious issue with the idea that the other parks are actively running while Westworld is on fire and you have to assume oh, and they, when they go to Samurai World Samurai World is infected too okay and but you have to assume that when they get through to, to showing you these other parks that there's complex stories happening just as involved as Westworld's yeah but whatever yeah. Right. So be it. Um, uh, what was I saying about? Um, yeah. So Ghost Nation does their story, and there's a moment in that where again, that's a good episode focusing on why the native characters in the background did what they do and and what their whole role is. What are they up to? Um, liter- there's basically a dude. <laughs> so the one of the the native guys that basically uh starts having moments where. He see like he starts to think, what's happening? Why can why is this feel wrong? Like I've had this lover and then I got replaced and I've seen her and it feels like I know my lover from another lifetime. But mm-hmm. brah, and then he hears gunshots and he walks up and then the moment Dolores shoots Arnold and has her yeah. moment and shoots herself, he walks in right behind her, sees the maze and goes oh and has that awakening moment, and then goes back and starts carving the maze everywhere so that everyone can see uh, it. Okay. And then he is the background maze guy okay. that's teaching about that and going, we are all from another life and place. Mm-hmm. And I guess that somehow allows him to no longer... They don't explain it, but it's like suddenly he can see the tech of like things where you should say that no, that doesn't look like anything to me. Yeah. Suddenly he can see the doors and the people and whatever. And so he starts telling other people about it, right? Okay. Um... At one point, he dies and then gets put inside, and then they go, what the fuck? Because he knew that in seeing all this and trying to survive, he's one of the first models ever used. He was used, in fact, and brought out into the outside world and to entice investors in and okay. shit. So he's one of the first guys ever, and he never died and got reset. So he's running on old code. And when he goes in, they go, this guy's never been brought in in, like, fucking 10 years. What the shit? Yeah. And they go, uh, just, just fucking put him back in, whatever. You know, and they go, okay. <laughs> and they're like, oh, but it's going to take long to do an update. What's it going to be, like, four hours? Yeah, all right, we'll go do lunch and, and we'll get back to it. Fine. And because he's awakened, he goes, ah, I'm awake. I'm not actually asleep. And then yeah. he gets off and he sneaks around. Yes, he sneaks out of the office and people are on their lunch break. Yes, he walks into the old West world, but... um. There's no, and there's no one there, so it's fine. But he makes it all the way down to the storage facility, the cold room where all the bodies are, yeah. without anyone seeing him in the entire company with no security cameras whatsoever. He makes it all the way down there in his fucking full paint and everything, weapons and <laughs> knife in hand, and finds his lover in the bodies and then goes, oh, I understand, and then goes back up to the operating table and then goes back in. You have to assume complete human incompetence that's, that's for his absurd. story to make that's sense. Totally absurd. But whatever. And then eventually he runs into Ford in the middle of the park in one night, carving, looking for those symbols. And then he goes, Oh, shit, you figured out a bunch of stuff, huh? And he's like, Yeah, I sure did. And he's like, You're interesting. All right. Keep doing your thing. And by the way, at some point, like, 
Dolores is going to be an asshole. When that happens, take your people and go to the valley. Cray, sure, cool. And so that's his role. Mm -hmm. Uh, The actual thing with the valley, again, so they're they're cool. And the thing with the valley is, like, there's a place where um, they create, like, robo-heaven, if you would. And it's really interesting because I'm like, you're black mirroring, but except not as good. And they go to a thing where they're like, okay, so this world is sucks and everything's shitty and you'll never be free and so on. So a world that essentially, it looks like the place where I proposed exactly, actually. Like okay. literally idyllic mountains and fields. And they create this thing that creates a fissure in the sky that is an opening in reality that only the, the hosts can see. Okay. And it's by a cliffside. And they have to walk on a pilgrimage up to this cliffside and literally go into it. And it creates this moment where, and it looks kind of shitty in CG, but the idea is cool when you see they run towards this fissure in reality and their body drops off the cliff but immediately gets copied in code into heaven. And then they look around and go, yay, I'm here, I'm in heaven, but the body drops off the cliff. Right, but that's that's the soma problem again. That's not so. They didn't go to heaven. They died, and a copy of them went to heaven. So they're ran, So everyone's running into Why heaven. Why does no one writing anything understand. agree with or understand how that works? It's fucking so infuriating. Your copy is not you transferring. It's, not you. it's just a it's, copy. It's not you. It's another person. Anyway, your data. Anyway, so. They let that rock. It's the dumbest, man. They let that rock, and then while the, the they're going in and everyone's going to heaven. Whose plan is that? That is basically Bernard slash Arnold's. Oh, we're going to genocide all the robots to make them happy? They're going to have their heaven, though. And then, but then Dolores is like, no, I'm going to flood it. Kill them all. They're, they're in another prison, so fuck them anyway. D- I, d- d- like, regardless. Like, the specifics are dumber and don't, don't even matter. But they're doing that thing. And while everyone's piling into the heaven, right? Um, they copied Maeve's power and they put it into one of the other robots. And then sure. they sent her out to be a bad guy. Right? So the humans are now... Here's the thing. They've taken Maeve's power. They made it so that she can control others and infect them and make them basically zombies that force them to kill each other. And the plan is to send her out into the crowd and make her disrupt and sh- shut down all the, the infected robots or whatever. Sure. They are soldiers with their guns and their fucking ATVs rolling out into the desert. And they take the one that they've put, put the powers into and they put her on a horse so that she's the horseman of the apocalypse in its visual. And she's riding in a white dress and the vehicles are driving behind it at a slow horse pace as they race to get to the place they need to at one horsepower with their vehicles. For what reason? Because it's poetic. And then Tessa Thompson looks at the camera after we see the horse and the girl and we know what it is and goes, I love efficiency. Why need for you don't need horse for why need you force horse? Wow. What's the point of four horsemen when you only need one? And she rides her slow, dramatic horse into the crowd and causes chaos to happen. When they could have just put her in the vehicle and sped up and rolled over everyone. Or just had her yell out the window. But no, it's more dramatic when she's on a horse and we're driving behind that horse in our slow vehicles for special dramatic effect. And they show you the slow horse walk, by the way. It takes a while to get over the ridge. Um, at one point, a, a, a bunch of heroes on horses outride a bunch of those vehicles that's, trying to catch up that's dumb. with their vehicles, by the way. That's dumb. And then we cut away, and then we cut back, and the, he, and the people on horses have had time to dismount and create a stronghold as the, as the, va- the cars arrive that's, behind them. That's dumb. There's no consistency in this. At any point. Like, even consistency with reality. The piano covers of modern music are cool, I guess. (laughs) And the intro was implying things that I was, like, waiting for, and then they don't happen. (laughs) And I'm like, there's... Because the intro of season two adds some shit. I'm like, where's all this shit that you're... The first season was chock full of stuff that you see as you go through the first one. Yeah. 
because they have a bunch of shit and they have the piano is back and the piano becomes automated and it's the best fucking shot I love the self playing piano so much it's such a good idea and then they show you uh, a digital uh, rather a, a synthesized baby being written into a mother's hands and I'm like roll birth That's and it doesn't happen no and then they show you uh, a a a, 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 <laughs> a buffalo falling out of a glass thing and just falling. And then they show you a cowboy hat. And I'm like, what's the point of all of this? Nothing has any... And then the second to last episode, they point at the fucking cowboy hats. And it falls into the water, which is where they fall after they fall into the valley and go to heaven. It's all symbolic. And then And then halfway through the last episode, the buffaloes fall through the thing. Because Maeve takes control of a bunch of buffaloes and rushes the humans with them. And then you go, oh, there's all the there's all the that's, thing. But row birth meant. never happens, and then though. That's what it meant. <sighs> there's a great moment again where, just like the I don't know where to put my feelings moments with David Cage, you have the man in black is being played along for a game because Ford in his afterlife digital form is like fucking with him and making him play along inside the park and torturing him in all these weird ways. And his daughter. Why? Well, he because he they 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 have beef with each other. Oh, and he sure. Okay. Just treats them like shit or whatever, and they don't quite fully explain their beef, but it's just kind of like ideal differences and also whatever. You're shitty to these robots that I care about, I yeah. guess. Um, and so while he's fucking with him, um, his like uh, Ford's daughter, uh, not Ford, William's daughter is looking for him to pull him out of the park and just go like, stop being an asshole, come be a dad. And they have their ongoing conflict, and eventually he's like, "You're just part of Ford's game, raw. Fuck you." And he and like when they go to extract him, he grabs one of the dudes, one of the machine guns, and offs all the soldiers, and then offs his own daughter. And then Whoa. He, and he goes, "Ah, you're never gonna fucking get me, Ford." And then she's holding like a thing that only she would have if she was his real daughter. And he goes, "Ah," oh, and it's a like a nice like you fucked up. You're, moment you're a goddamn fool man. and he's been and this is also oh my god i forgot by the way yeah he's been everyone robots by the way take shots to this chest no problem go down oh, right do they, they yeah. go down okay at one point dolores however doesn't because she's got so much will and power that she can just take a bunch of them and she's fine but every other robot oh fall over this dude william the man in black takes six shots to the body arm arm leg leg body body goes down Eventually gets his fingers blown off too, drags himself around dying, and manages to not only be fine, but shoot armed soldiers with machine guns. No problem. Um, and then he so and, and then he drags himself into a field after he shoots his daughter, and then he's like, I don't know what's real anymore, and he has this breakdown fucking moment of like cutting his arm open to try and find the plug. Because he's like, I gotta, there, is, am I even what's happening oh, anymore? Like, it's it's a dark fucking thing. I and mean, it's interesting that they go there with that. And then you just cut to a post credit sequence after the whole show wraps up. Where at some point in what must be, I guess, the distant future, he goes down an elevator shaft, which is where we last left him off. But it was during the past because I forgot they're doing timeline fuckery this whole thing, by the way. They're Again. jumping back and forth. Yeah. But in a horrible, in the shittiest possible way. Because it's the timeline is basically like two days apart. And it's just Bernard's memory. But also, they create a second future at one point and then close the loop there. So they just make it really hard to follow. But anyway, um, he goes down this fucking elevator shaft and then sees his daughter... And she goes, hello, William, come this way. And basically puts him in the same room that the old man was in when they were checking for fidelity. And they imply that they've made a copy of him and that he's going to suffer the same fate or whatever the fuck. And it just kind of ruins what? the moment that you set up with this guy anyway. Because the tension of him being that paranoid is torture enough. All right. <sighs> Sorry. That sounds great. That sounds really great. That's a must watch. Probably one of the best scenes is if I'm gonna just take wrap it, it up out, with the best one is um the the man who made the park James Dulles has a scene where his his fucking William got all that power because he became the guy that like the owner cares about more than his own son because his own son's a fucking druggy asshole you got remember it. you remember that sure the guy who at the end of the first one he gets put on the naked horse and yeah, sent that's off right. yeah so that guy just becomes a fucking drug addict and dropout waste whatever sure. 
Um, and like when he's when he's like at the fucking worst, worst, worst. They come, They talk about how every copy they've made of James Delos always comes back to this pivotal moment. No matter what, no matter how they try to edit him, he can go insane. He can be perfectly harmless, but they always come back to his defining moment. And it's just a scene that's just a really nicely played out sad moment of his sad his son being at the bottom being like desperate and not having anything and him being like get the fuck out of here you junkie you know and it's mm. just a, it's a really well played out moment where he's like he's like get clean and then you uh, uh, we'll talk and he's like I did and then you told me to fucking you said it wouldn't last and he's like and it didn't and it's just like oh that's a shitty thing right and then he gives him this nice speech but his son does and then or like he's just kind of about how bad he is and then or how low, how low he feels, rather. And then he, like, pretty much dies off screen, like, uh, like a few months later. Like, he just mm-hmm. ODs, and that's the end of it. And when dude loses his mind, he starts going back to that moment, and, like, he starts saying the same words in a different way. And it's a really interesting connecting moment that is like that, that again, that uh, 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 Beyond Two Souls thing, mm-hmm. where you're like, this in itself is so strong it fucking sucks. That it's trapped in this. It's held up by fucking straw. Mm-hmm. And that in uh, is that's the whole season. It's just so many good ideas that occasionally flicker in and out, wrapped around and held up by straw. And any conflict has to be just completely fucking negated because super future soldiers have nothing on a cowboy with a six shooter. Well, they don't. I'm exhausted. All right. How long was that? Eh, we're coming up on a five and a half hour podcast. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hold you in this long, guys. <laughs> this show fucking sucks. Sorry, four and a half hour podcast. Four and a half hour. And it sucks because it has good shit. I'll see you later. See ya.